All right, A-Push Scholars, welcome to another installment of Beamer Home Video, otherwise known as A-Push Videos. This is Chapter 39B, uh, the end of Chapter 39. We'll continue with the Cold War, the late 1940s, early 1950s. We want to thank Nina, Nina the singer and her band from the 1980s with 99 Red Balloons, or in German, it's 99 Luft Balloons. What a great, interesting song, and of course it relates to the Cold War and the launching of the arms race and nuclear weapons. Well, we got a lot to talk about in this uh, video, a lot of major events uh, post-World War II, late 1940s, early 1950s. Out of all of these years, I think the year that was worse for the United States, pick it out, which one, which one's the worst year? It's not even on here, 1949, oh, there it is, 1949 is probably the worst year uh, of this early Cold War in terms of bad things happening. A lot to talk about today, dealing with foreign policy and the Cold War and the Cold War at home with the suspected communists. All right, let's talk some foreign policy. The United Nations, must know an A push, was developed in 1945. We know that what conference did it really get going? The Yalta Conference is really where the big three met to talk about the United Nations. And so it begins in 1945 um, in San Francisco. And of course, today the UN is located in New York City. Uh, one of the key things about the UN you need to know is that it's made up of two parts. The General Assembly, where all the nations are a part of and get a vote, but the biggest part of the UN, the second part, is the Security Council. That's made up of the big five countries of post-World War II, and all of them had veto power uh, to um, override or, or to negate a law uh, they thought was not fitting for them. Also, uh, the United Nations created Israel in 1948, which is located in the Palestine region along the Mediterranean Sea. And Israel will be important in a push because Israel has a couple of, of important wars, must know wars, especially with Egypt uh, in the 1970s. It's going to cause conflict and headaches uh, for the United States. All right, let's get to probably the most important area post-World War II, and that is in Germany. Uh, many of the Nazis were tried and executed for their crimes against humanity uh, post-World War II. Uh, for a push, though, more, more importantly, is that Germany and eventually um, Berlin is divided into four military zones of occupation. The United States, the Soviet Union, France, and Great Britain all controlled part of Germany and also part of Berlin, which is going to cause conflict. Eventually, the Western allies, the United States, France, and Great Britain, has decided to join forces and create one reunited Germany, a democratic capitalist West Germany. The communists decide to tighten their grip and make it East Germany. So for about 40 to 45 years, Germany is divided into two different countries. Growing up, I only knew of two Germanys, East and West Germany, but they were only around for 45 years during the Cold War. And in addition, the city of Berlin was divided into East and West Berlin. West Berlin was a democratic city. East Berlin was a communist city. The interesting thing in the must-known A push is that West Berlin, despite being democratic and capitalist, they were located in the heart of communist East Germany. Show the map, Beamer. And here is the map, and you can see Berlin divided into two uh, cities, and Berlin is located clearly in the middle of East Germany, which was communist. All right, Eastern European countries right here, three important ones, especially East Germany and Poland. Uh, also, Romania and other countries were considered satellite nations of the Soviet Union. must know this term, satellite nations, nations controlled by the Soviets, despite being their own separate country. Basically, they had to answer to the Soviet Union and the communist leaders. An Iron Curtain thus has been, has been descended upon Eastern Europe. That was a quote or a speech from Winston Churchill talking about how the Soviet Union has taken away freedoms and rights from these people, how they're forced to be communists in Eastern Europe. And the Iron Curtain basically divides East and Western Europe. It's not a real curtain. It's not a real thing. It's just a metaphor to show the real division between Eastern and Western Europe, between capitalism and democracy, versus communism. All right, here's one of the most important events in a push foreign policy post-World War II. Berlin is the, the flashpoint city, the important city um, in the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift happened 1948-1949 as some context. The Soviet Union led by what man? Ugh, Joseph Stalin is still around. He does not die until 1953. Stalin, leader of the Soviet Union, basically cuts off all railroad and roads into West Berlin. So we talked about in the previous slide how Berlin is located in eastern Germany, excuse me, east Germany, communist Germany. Uh, and so Stalin cuts off all access routes. And so he basically wants to starve the people of West Berlin. And eventually these people, he hoped, would have to turn to communism. 
while the United States was not willing to give up West Berlin, so they come up with a plan along with their allies of the Berlin Airlift, another important event. These two hand, events go hand in hand, 1948-1949. The United States government, West Germany, and uh, France and Great Britain, we decide to airlift for over one year supplies into West Berlin. All by airplane, we drop supplies into the airport uh, to feed the people, clothe the city, give them resources. So in the end, it works. The Berlin airlift is a great victory uh, for the United States in democratic countries in that they saved West Berlin from turning communist. However, 1949, a lot of other bad events happened. We'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, before we get to the struggles of 1949, let's talk about some very important must-knows in push Containment must-know. Now, we know this guy, George F. Kennan, um, United States uh, military leader, helped devise this policy. And I don't even know if he was Secretary of State at the time. I don't know his, his role in the government, but he came up with the idea of containment. This is our policy, really, for the next 45 years. We are going to contain Soviet expansion. We're going to stop communism. We can't take over communism, so we're not going to invade Eastern Europe but we're going to not let it spread to the democratic areas. That is a containment policy. Give me evidence that we did it. The evidence of that are these two documents. The Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan must know. Truman Doctrine 1947 said we're going to help any country starting to fall to communism. So this basically is our containment policy written as a document named after Truman. Example of the Truman Doctrine, the United States gives $400 million to Greece and Turkey to resist communist expansion. An even bigger um, plan was called the Marshall Plan, 1948. Secretary of State George Marshall comes up with this idea, basically saying that we are going to help Western European countries. Maybe I would write that down. Western European countries were given given close to 12 to 13 billion, I like to say 13 billion, 13 billion dollars to recover their economy, to prevent them from turning communist. So this also is an example of containment, the United States giving all this money away to prevent communist expansion and helping their economies recover, which did they eventually do. The Soviets especially are unhappy with the Marshall Plan, thinking the United States is trying to buy democracy and capitalism. Uh, But in the end, this plan works, and communism does not spread into Western Europe. How did that happen? Well, I just love that song so much I had to get more of it. So 99 Red Balloons, foreign policy. Here we go. All right, so now we got some uh, important um, foreign policy um, government agencies being created in the 1940s and 50s. I would highlight the National Security Act. It created three new foreign policy departments or agencies. The NSC, I think that's important to know, and then the CIA in the Department of Defense. These three things, these three government agencies were created to help foreign policy against the Soviets. So it was uh, massive government spending in this regard. Maybe more importantly on this page is NATO. Highlight this. North Atlantic Treaty Organization, this is an alliance, okay, which again, for most of our history, believed in non-alliances, um, isolationism, but we formed this alliance with Western European countries saying that an attack against wall, it's an attack against all, and this is called collective security, and of course, it goes against the policy of isolationism. And so we are truly um, internationalist country now. And so the purpose to keep the Russians out and the Germans down and the Americans in. In response, I definitely would highlight this. The Warsaw Pact is created by the Soviet Union six years later, 1955. This is an alliance of Eastern European countries, Poland, Bulgaria, Hungary, and so on. Uh, East Germany that are going to help communist countries if they get attacked. So now, unfortunately, it just takes one to cause a world war. But hey, we get to play with um, 99 red balloons as they go by. Love that song. This could be a 25-minute video. I'm going to try to be quicker. All right, here we go. Let's talk about Douglas MacArthur. Okay, let's not talk about him too much. We'll talk about him when we get to the Korean War, but he does help reconstruct Japan uh, in 1946 after World War II. All right, Mao Zedong, need to know him. And the biggest thing on this page, China becomes communist. There's that year, 1949. I said that's a bad year for American foreign policy. A lot of bad things happen. This is one of the major ones. The Chinese become a communist country. um, And that shows that the policy of containment is not working. Truman was heavily criticized for this, that he cannot contain communists. Because the biggest country, population-wise, in the world 
has now become a communist country and so is starting to scare Americans. Well, these things can't get much worse than that, right? Um, wrong. Things got even worse. 1949, September, there's that year again. President Truman announces that the Soviets had exploded their first atomic bomb. It took them only four years after the United States to explode the first at- their first atomic bomb. And we thought that uh, there's no way they could do it. It would take them decades for them to detonate the atomic bomb to get the technology. But they were able to do that. And now we have the arms race is now going to really intensify between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. An example of the arms race intensifying is 1952. Fire up. We did it. Ha! In your face, Soviets. We exploded the first hydrogen bomb, allegedly a thousand times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is inconceivable to think about a thousand times more powerful, but it was the H-bomb. Fortunately for the United States, six months later, within a year, the Soviets also detonated their first hydrogen bomb. So the arms race is going to continue to intensify. And I think... Uh, the 1950s especially had the greatest intensity of arms race up until the year 1962 with the, what what's the event? 62, JFK, Khrushchev, Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis is the height of the Cold War. I'll mention that a lot over the next week or two. All right, let's turn our attention away from other countries. And let's look inside the United States during the post-World War II America. And this is during the second Red Scare. And there it is. I better have this on this slide. The second Red Scare, post-World War II really from like 1947, 48 until the early 1950s, uh, late 40s, early 50s is the second Red Scare. Of course, that is the fear of communism in the United States. There he is, uh, the Prince of Darkness, Richard Nixon himself. He was a strong anti-communist, especially early in his political career. The interesting thing about Nixon is he changes, um, and he actually brings about detente. Ooh, detente, detente, detente. Okay, detente is a word we'll need to know later. We talk about 1970s. Um, foreign policy with the Soviet Union, maybe you already know what detente is. It has nothing to do with dentistry. All right, so let's get back to the video then. So so Truman was concerned about uh, communists taking over the United States, so he launches a massive loyalty program um, with 3 million federal employees to make sure that they are not communists. More importantly, though, I'd highlight HUAC, H-U-A-C, HUAC, the House Committee on Un-American Activities, and they were formed even before World War II begins, but their job is to investigate subversion in the United States, um, people who are spies, perhaps from other countries in the United States, and especially communists. And they accuse many people, I would highlight this, in the movie industry of communists. The biggest reason why they're afraid of the movie industry is because of the power of the media, and they figured many uh, movie producers, actors, could try to influence Americans by trying to make them turn communist without them even maybe even knowing it. All right, know that name, Joe McCarthy. We'll have a reading on him um, on Friday about Joe McCarthy, one of the most infamous Americans ever. And he went around basically spreading lies about people and spreading rumors, and he ruined the lives of many people, especially in the State Department, uh, the government agency that controls foreign policy, accused of over 200 uh, Americans in this department of being communist. He had no proof. He never did prove it. Um, but he still was able to keep his job as senator. Some people by 1950, early 50s, were starting to question him. Uh, but he kept going and he did influence a lot of people until 1954 when he accused the wrong people. Don't mess with the army. We'll get to that a little bit later. But Joe McCarthy accused many people of communists. He was wrong. No proof. Um, a lot of, ooh, name the book, 1953, I think it's Arthur Miller, what is his, what is the book, what is the book, I think John Proctor's in it, The Crucible, is basically about the lies spread by Joe McCarthy, all right, these two people, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, were accused of being spies, brought to trial, convicted, and they were executed in 1953, and that scared many Americans, thinking, oh my goodness, this cute little old couple, how can they be communist spies, uh, and so that made many, many people fearful that anybody, their next door neighbor could be a communist uh, and so that also is, is an example of the Red Scare. Now, Julius and Ethel, they did say that they were communists, but they uh, denied until their death that they were ever spies for the Soviet Union. I'm trying to think of some synthesis here. Uh, maybe Sacco Vanzetti, maybe 1920s. Similarities between Sacco Vanzetti and the Rosenbergs, perhaps. Always think about synthesis. All right, let's talk a little politics here. The election of 1948, we've got... Dewey, Republican versus Truman, the Democrat. Truman has been president since the death of FDR in 1945. But this is the first election that Harry Truman, there he is from Missouri, has to run as president. And it was a very, very close election. 
Uh, and Truman does eventually squeak out a victory, but it was so close that the Chicago Tribune has one of the most uh, infamous gaffes in journalism history where the Chicago Tribune had the headline, Dewey defeats Truman. We, of course, know that that never happened. Let's talk about some specifics here, though, of that election. A new group that I want you to highlight, the Dixiecrats. Uh, these were white Southern Democrats, and they actually started to split away from the Democratic Party, form their own third-party candidate, um, and these Dixiecrats created the state's rights party ticket. And so the key thing is they're white Southerners and they are starting to go away from the Democratic Party. And this really uh, begins completely by 1964. And until, of course, today, present day Republicans um, from the white Southerners, they have a strong connection together. And I mentioned that headline there, Dewey defeats Truman, which we know, of course, was incorrect. All right, some specifics of Truman's domestic policy and just policies in general as president. All right, I have point four here, and how important this is, I don't know, just having an understanding of, of his foreign policy programs. Of course, the biggest thing he believes in is containment, uh, but he also did want to help inside America. Uh, he did want to help Americans and continue a lot of the New Deal programs, and Truman's program is called the Fair Deal. So he's trying to connect it to FDR's New Deal programs, Unfortunately for Truman, a lot of these were unsuccessful and not really supported by the American people, partly because the economy was doing pretty good and they did not really want any more government interventions because we weren't in the Depression anymore. So I think an A push, the most important thing, is that overall the Fair Deal programs were not a success. It, they were a failure overall. And as I mentioned, they did not want the government involvement as much uh, because the economy is strong into the 1950s. Unlike FDR's New Deal when we were in the Great Depression, they were looking for more government involvement to help them out of their struggle. The first major war of the Cold War, and it is not the United States versus the Soviet Union, it is the United States in Korea, and it's called the Korean War, also called the Forgotten War, kind of because it's right between World War II, worst war in the history of mankind, and the Vietnam War, uh, the only war the United States really ever lost. Let's talk about the Korean War. It begins in 1950. I would have known the year Truman was president during this time, and it begins with the North Koreans, who are communists. They invaded South Korea, who was a non-communist country. And so because of our containment policy, we need to help out the South Koreans. And so Truman greatly increased his military spending um, as he wanted from this document, NSC 68, National Security Council document 68. I would highlight this document. Basically, it was given to Truman in 1950. That's the year and it encouraged containment, which we already knew about. But it suggested the rapid buildup of weapons essential for survival. So this greatly increases military spending even more. Uh, and of course, the H-bomb was detonated two years later in 1952 on a deserted island, not on people, but it was detonated. And so this really increases the arms race, saying we're going to have a great military spending on weapons, especially hydrogen and nuclear weapons. Now let's get back to the Korean War, though. Because the Soviet Union was not there at the time when this came up for a debate, uh, Truman helped issue a UN agreement to send troops to fight against the aggressors of North Korea. So the United Nations, it's not the United States, yes, we were the vast majority of soldiers, but the United Nations sends troops to fight against North Korea to protect South Korea uh, from the communists. He also orders General Douglas MacArthur uh, to Korea, and he's going to lead our forces in, in Korea against the North Koreans. All right, I'll try to be quick through the military issues of the Korean War. All right, so basically MacArthur does arrive and does protect South Korea, and they're able to drive the North Koreans back across the 38th parallel, which divided the two Korean um, countries towards China. But in November, the Chinese, I would highlight this, the Chinese does, the Chinese, excuse me, do come in and help out the North Koreans, and they actually push our soldiers back across the 38th parallel. And this is where it's going to be for the next three years. From 1950 to the end of the war in 1953, it is a fight uh, between the United States and the North Koreans, but mostly against Chinese forces for three years. The war ends in a stalemate. 
Um, and really, there is no true winner. It's a tie, the Korean War. MacArthur does want to blockade China, wants to bomb them, wants to go into China, invade China, um, bomb Manchuria. Truman will not allow him to do that. He did not want to escalate the war, so there was conflict. Truman was all about limited war, only fighting on the Korean Peninsula. MacArthur, who wanted victory, and that's kind of his personality, wanted total war. Uh, he actually might have been more in favor of dropping nuclear weapons on the Chinese, perhaps, as well. Was a lot more aggressive. In the end, Truman got his wish on limited war. MacArthur, being MacArthur, criticizes Truman's decision as being weak. Actually criticizes the president, and then Truman had to remove MacArthur's forces. MacArthur comes back to the United States as a hero. Ticker tape parade in New York City. The great American willing to stand up against the communists. So MacArthur does come back to America, but as he's in America, the war drags on for another couple years until 1953 when Eisenhower decides to end the Korean War, or conflict as it was known. All right, I promise no more of the song. It's done, and thankfully so is this video. I'm guessing 24 minutes. I could be wrong. All right, let's finish up the Korean War then. So Truman was criticized heavily in America for being soft on the communists. Uh, they call him a Judas, a traitor, uh, for not going into China and fighting. And like I mentioned, the, the war continued for two more years. Uh, it was a stalemate. Unfortunately, over 50,000 Americans died in the Korean conflict or war. Um, and then it finally ends in 1953 when Eisenhower becomes president. He ends the war. It ends in a stalemate. Was it a victory or was it a loss? Well, it's your POV, your point of view. It was a victory, the Korean conflict, because we stopped the spread of communism into South Korea. But it was a loss from another point of view because we're not able to drive communism out of North Korea. In the end, unfortunately, many Americans did die um, in the Korean conflict.